So, today's message is going to be about holiness through love. And uh, as Josh mentioned, sometimes we have fights and struggles throughout our weeks and days. And sometimes it's the enemy that wants to harass us, and other times it's the Lord that chastens us. And um, today is more about the chastening than the harassment. I just want to open up this message. Uh, Hebrews 12, and that is, we're going to read 11, Hebrews 12, 11, um, and that goes all the way down to 17. And I'm really blessed by this message. I hope uh, you'll be blessed and encouraged. I'm just going to, before I start, I'm just going to pray. Um, so, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for all the people that made it here. Uh, thank you for Mike and Christy that are here, and thank you for Gary and Nancy and that uh, celebration yesterday. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to guide me. I ask you to help me to preach this message, and that all the glory would go to Jesus, and that hearts would be changed, and lives would be changed, and hearts would be encouraged, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So it says in Hebrews 12, 11, it just starts at an... At 11 it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it word, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And as I was studying this, I thought it was really neat. It says you are going to be trained by it. And like all of us know, if you go to Chet's garage and you ask Chet to help you gain some muscle, he'll tell you, you got to be trained. You got to be willing to be trained, right? Chet can't do that for you. We have to put in the sweat, blood and tears to, to become more fit physically. And the same way I understand this scripture. For those who have been trained by it, the chastening of the Lord is really a training that he lets you and me walk through out of love. So he knows what we need. He knows what is ahead of us. And he says, I know my daughter and my son. And I know this is going to be coming up in the future. And I don't want them to go through this without being trained. So he chastens us. He gets rid of stuff that will make us fail. Same as in the army. The soldiers will be trained for combat. They'll be trained. They're not going to tell them a bunch of uh, rosy stories and say it's going to be really fun and nice and some really fun adventure. No, they are preparing them for every possible situation. Each individual, each position has a different focus. The, the medic has a different focus than the, than the sergeant or the gunner or whatever you want to do. As a Christian, that's the same for us. So we have a Heavenly Father that knows what is in front of us, right? He knows what's behind us. He knows what is in front of us. And he will train us by chastening us, exactly how you and I would train our kids. And then it says, therefore, strengthen those hands which hang down, right? Lift some dumbbells, right? Get some muscles. And those feeble knees, hike some mountains. Go to Montana, in the spirit, I mean, and uh, go hiking. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame might not, may not be dislocated, but rather it be healed. So by training us, he heals us. See, this is the whole thing. All of us have a past. None of us, or all of us in this room, there were things in our past that we didn't choose, right? That just happened and they really affected us. And so the same will be in the future. There will be things that happen that are out of our control. But God's desire for you and me is to train us. And he only does that by chastening. So don't despise that. And it's sometimes hard and it's painful, but it's necessary. When I had a shoulder injury, and perhaps Chet can agree with this, I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. But I had a sh shoulder injury, and as I was training my, soldier, my, my shoulder in the gym, the pain left over a period of weeks, but it was painful, but I had to train it, I had to move it, I had to get stronger again because of the injury, my shoulder got really weak. That's the same for you and me. 
It can get really weak. We can get very weak in an area, and God won't ignore it like some of us Christians like to do. We like to put it under the carpet and forget about it. God will highlight it because he says, this is not okay. It's like when you jump in your tractor in the morning or you jump in your truck, you want to check that everything runs. That's what God is doing with the chastening. So then it says in 1415, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble, and by this many, many become defiled. So he says we're supposed to pursue peace, and then he says in holiness, and without holiness, none of us, none of us will see the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And then he actually says, be careful that you don't fall from grace. Now, there are many preachers in America that will preach super grace. You can't fall from grace. But the Bible clearly states that that is possible. That's why we need holiness. Now, here's the trick. If you want to achieve holiness by yourself, you're going to fail. And that's what my message will be all about. But he warns about falling from grace. And then he talks about the root of bitterness. Once again, I said there are things that happen in your past. Do you have a root of bitterness somewhere? Maybe as a young child, maybe as a teenager, maybe as a young adult. Get rid of the root of bitterness. And perhaps some of the things that are happening in your life or have happened are because God is highlighting that root of bitterness because he wants to pull it out. But if you don't let him, then it will remain. So sometimes we have to discern between, okay, this is the enemy and this is the, this is the Lord. And it's all not going to be lovey-dovey and, you know, lightning coming from heaven and all that. God will try to get rid of that weed, that root of bitterness in your life because he loves you. And we have to think about that. We, we tend to think about God uh, doesn't love us if he disciplines us. Or people, people don't love you if, the, if they tell you the truth. No, that's not true. If it's, if it's from a right heart, if a person tells you truth from a heart that, that loves you, that's, that's the best thing you can receive. Because sometimes we are blind to it, right? We, are, we don't see everything. None of us see everything. The Bible says a person that trusts, trusts themselves is a fool. So let me go deeper into this message. Um, without holiness, no one will see God. Um, stay in Hebrews, I'm just going to quote this verse, 2 Corinthians 7.1 says, Therefore, having the promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's another scripture that speaks of this. And now I want to look at verse 16 and 17, and the most of the message will be based on what we're going to read here. So it says, in verse 15 at the end it says, and by this many become defiled, and then it goes into verse 16 and it says, lest there be a f any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Esau was called. Esau was called to be the firstborn. Esau was called to inherit the blessing. Esau was called to inherit the honor, the right of the, of the firstborn. That was his calling. But we all know the story, what happened, right? It says here very clearly, for one morsel of food, he sold what he had. And I think Esau can be a representation of us believers sometimes. I think Esau can be a representation of a worldly person, a, a sinner that doesn't know Christ. Right? Because he, he, didn't consider, he didn't consider his future. He didn't consider his calling. He was just living in day in, day out. The day mattered. It didn't, the future didn't matter. A lot of sinners will live like that. They actually will 
ignore the thought of what is, what is to come. They ignore the thought of death. They ignore the thought of what else is there in life. They try to distract themselves. So Esau was a very fleshly person. But in some regards, it can also represent a believer that has started right and then gets dragged into the world and forgets about his birthright, forgets about the blessings that God has for him. And it's not the blessing so much here on earth as it's the blessing of what is to come. The honor, what it means to be a Christian. That was a huge honor back then. The firstborn was an honored individual in the family. But he forgot all about that. He forgot all about that just for a bowl of soup. And when I started reading this and studying it, it just, to me, the Lord was speaking of, obviously, the believer. He was called according to God's purpose. But he forgot about it. He had other things that were more important in his life. Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.9 says, and you all know this verse, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Every one of you is called with a holy calling. Every one of you. But then it says, it's not according to our works. It's not according to what you or I can do. It's not according to how much weight we can lift. It's all about how much he can lift. And he lifts off the yoke of our back, right? That's what he does. We like, to, we like to carry weight. We like to do it out of our own strength. But what he wants is to lift it off our backs. Because then he will get the glory. And that's all about relationship. And it continues in that verse just really quickly. It says, but according to his own purpose in grace. That's how he called you and me. It's according to his purpose. Not your purpose. Not my purpose. His purpose. Not your strength, not my strength, His grace. That's what will make us walk the path of holiness. But let's go back to Esau. A morsel of food. What does it stand for? It can stand for many things, but I think very plainly it stands for the flesh. Because in our flesh, we are hungry, right? Work with some men. If you don't feed them by 12, uh oh you're going to have some hammers flying on the job site. I get very cranky when I don't eat. Very cranky when I'm working and I'm not eating, I get cranky. Unless I'm fasting, that's different. But we all know how hard it is to fast, to deny that strong desire not to eat. So that morsel of food is really talking about the flesh. And that's the same in our lives as believers. Are you pleasing the flesh? Are you on your own way? Do you do what you want to do? Do you please men even? All these things are fleshly. We are supposed to walk the way that God gave us, that he prepared for us. That's the way we are supposed to be on. But the flesh will always pull you off that path. That flesh will always pull you towards men. And you'll start pleasing men instead of God. Why do we start pleasing men? Because it's a lot easier to please men. It's a lot easier to please men. It's very hard sometimes to please God and say no to men. So these, this morsel of food talks about us believers saying, I want what I want when I want it. I want to be planning my life. It's all flesh. And that's what brought Esau to the place that he was in. That was what brought Esau to fall. But God wants to cleanse us from that. And he can only do that by chastening us. He can only do that by chastening us. He wants to get rid of all these desires because he knows that all these fleshly desires will lead us the wrong direction. And he's a loving father. He is waiting for everyone here. He's waiting. He says, come on. Come on to me. Walk through the eye of the needle. Come to me. But he only does that through chastening. And that is really what holiness is about. Will you let him do that? Will you let him chasten you? Because we know we can't do it in our own works. But will you let him? See, it's all about him. It's not about what you and I can do. And then he says, 
he uses the word fornicator. Now, we all know what a fornicator is, but for the case that some doesn't, some people don't know, it's a person who has intercourse with someone who they are not married to. Who are we as Christians? We are the bride of Christ. That's who we are. Now, going back to Esau, he's called a fornicator. That's a strong word, very strong word. Why is he called a fornicator? It's as a representation that he was not acting as the bride of Christ. We are the bride. He's the bridegroom. He waits for us, right? He wants to cleanse us, make us more beautiful. That's why he uses the word fornicator, because Esau put the desires of the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of his own heart before Jesus. And as a picture, obviously before God back then, but as a picture, as a believer, do you put the desires of your flesh before the Lord? And then he uses another word. He uses a profane person. A profane person treats something that is sacred, holy, with irreverence and disrespect. What did he do? He had this birthright. An amazing birthright. Isaac was not just any other farmer. He wasn't just any other Jew. He was Isaac, right? Son of Abraham. And he didn't even think about that. He was so concerned with the world, so concerned with what he wanted, that he forgot about it. He actually didn't even forget about it. He decided against it. He's, he rather wanted a bowl of food. And that really speaks, and you say, how is that possible? Well, that really speaks on how strong our flesh really is. How strong our flesh really is. There have been many mighty men and women of God that God was using powerfully to, to, to shake the nation, and because of a desire of the flesh, they, they, they failed. What about David? Mighty, mighty king, anointed. All authority, he loved the Lord. But there was that one moment where he was weak in the flesh. Now you and I, we all going to have that. But that is why it's so important for us to be chastened. And you can see in David's life, he was chastened over and over and over and over again. And that didn't happen in Esau. So Ephesians 5.27 says, and this is just in regards to the word fornicator, bride of Christ, it says that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that he should be holy, she should be holy and without blemish. That's what he's after in you and me. Now, we can't do it. We will fail, but he will present to himself a church. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, I'll let you work on this area. I'll let you work on, 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 on my ambitions. I'll let you work on my dreams even. In many churches, in many preachers, preach a lot about fulfill your own dreams, fulfill your own dreams. That is not scriptural. That is not scriptural. I don't know how many of you have read the Song of Solomon. It's one of those very, very unique books in the Bible. And I just want to read this. This is, is well, this is Song of Solomon 5, and that's 2 to 3. And it really speaks of the Lord and the bride. And it says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, my holy one, undefiled. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? This is the beloved speaking. The, 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 the woman in this story is saying, how can I put it on again? Obviously, she's talking about spiritual things because if you take your rope off you wouldn't ask me saying hey how do i put that on again well the same way you took it off you put it back on put your fingers through it uh, your hands hands through it and you'll be fine so she's talking about something spiritual what she's talking about is i have taken off my 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 sin my my, my sinful nature is stripped away and she's asking how can i put it back on 
because I have been on the other side. I have tasted your goodness. I have sa- tasted your cleansing. And then the sh- she says the same. I have washed my feet. How can I defile them again? It's talking about a believer that has yes said yes to the Lord, that has experienced his cleansing, his goodness, and he, really we're saying, how can I go backwards? How is that possible? How can I go backwards to my sinful ways? It's impossible. But he says, he called to her my perfect one, my undefiled. And it really speaks of the body of Christ. It speaks of the bride. And the bride will not treat something that is sacred with disrespect. What does that mean in our lives? How sincere are you during worship? How sincere are you when you worship the Lord? Worship is, for example, one of the most precious things that we can do as a believer. How sincere are you in that? But how much reverence do you give to the Scriptures? My other question is, are you taking advantage of His love? A profane person will take the love of Christ and disregard it. Will use it, take advantage of it. Yes, I receive your forgiveness. Yes, I want to go to heaven. Yes, I want to sense your love. I want to feel your love. I want you to heal me. I want to bless my finances. All these things. But are you taking advantage of what he has done? He paid the highest price on the cross. Do you live your life according to that price? And all of us will come to an answer. Well, sometimes yes, sometimes perhaps no, or maybe we don't know. But even that thought, you know, that thought, that thought of reflection, am I living this day according to the price that he has paid? I know that's a heavy question, but what does that produce? It produces holiness, because it's a thought of reflection. He knows that you and I are imperfect. He knows that we have to deal with the flesh. He knows that we'll have to deal with the devil. He knows that we sometimes argue and fight and have divisions. He knows all of that. But what he wants, same as David, he knew David was not perfect. But what did he say? He was a man after his heart. Why? Because when David failed, he repented. And that's the same for you and me. But the danger is that there are believers and that there are preachers that preach that it's all okay. It's all super grace. You can sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. Which is true if your heart is right. But if your heart is in a way of a profane person that takes advantage of it, you are in great danger. In great danger. I don't have time to go into the the scripture, but I, if you want to write it down, just read Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. I mean, he talks about people that are willfully sinning. You ever wonder what that is? That's what I'm talking about. It's about a, a person that is profane, that disregards the price that he paid, and that takes advantage of that. And that's what Esau did. He did not regard the birthright. He did not regard the honor, the blessing that he would receive. He just looked at the flesh. So my question to you today is, do you understand the honor, what, it's, what it means to be a child of God, the honor that you have in the spiritual realm? Maybe not so much in this world anymore because a lot of Christians are ridiculed. But do you understand the honor? Every person in this room that is a child of God, the honor that the Son of God would have come and died for us. You're part of His family. You're part of the family of the highest God of all the universe. That is an honor. Do you understand that? Do you understand the blessing that you receive? for being a Christian, for saying yes to the Lord. And most importantly, do you understand your birthright? We are all 
born again, right? The moment you and I were born again, you, were, you received the birthright of a, of a believer. And I'm going to get into this. I'm giving you a lot of scripture, so just bear with me. Um, in Titus chapter 3, and this is verse 4 to 7, we talk about this birthright. It says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness, that's again, it's not by our works, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Every one of us was, was saved by mercy. And then he goes on and says, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs, speaks about the birthright, according to the hope of eternal life. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in, this, in these three verses. But what you and I have to remember is we were all saved by grace. And the washing of regeneration talks about being born again. That's what it's talking about. It's, it's called spiritual renewal. If you look up the definition for the word, it's spiritual renewal. That's what happened when you and I accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We were born again. Something changed deep inside of us, right? Why did it change? Because you received the birthright. That's why it changed. What does that birthright speak about? Well, right at the end. Heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is your and my right. We are heirs. If you're an heir, you receive something, right? A birthright. The hope of eternal life. Do you live your life according do you live your life according to that? Is that in your mind when you make decisions? Is that, hey, this is where I'm going. This is the price that was paid for me. I'm gonna live my life according to that. And then he goes on, and this is where many people stop. They stop when they are born again. They say, this is it. I have arrived. I have received my birthright. And I would say, yes, you did. Absolutely, you did. But God didn't stop there. God knew that you and I needed something else. That's why he says, through the washing of regeneration, through being born again, and renewing of the Holy Spirit. He didn't stop there. He knew it is still impossible for them to live a holy life. We have now a birthright. We know we are where we are going, right? But he said earlier, when we read the other verse, you can fall from grace, right? Without holiness, you will not see the Lord. The birthright did not get rid of my, our flesh, right? We all can testify, right? Monday morning, 5 o'clock, a lot of your flesh is going to be alive. You can be born again, again, and again, and again, but your flesh is still going to be alive, right? So he knew, he knew there was something else we need. And that was the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit starts working, if we accept him, starts working on our mind. Because all of us know there's a lot of funny thoughts in our minds, right? Good that we don't have like little bubbles over our heads. Even right now as you think about it, think, uh, look at me and I could see what all of you guys think. Good that that is not the case, right? Right? So he knew that he had to renew our mind. And he poured on us abundantly the Holy Spirit whom he poured on us abundantly. Not a little bit. Not just one time, you know, I felt a little tingle in my left shoulder and that was it, praise the Lord. No, there's a lot more to the Holy Spirit than what we feel. The Holy Spirit is our guide. So he knew, even though they received the birthright, even though Jacob stole it, 
Look at Jacob's life. There was a lot of what happening. Chastening was happening in Jacob's life, right? Look at his story. Look what he went through. He was betrayed, right? He was cheated. He was chastened. So Jacob got the birthright, but he still was prepared and chastened and changed and changed and changed. And the man that came back was a different man than when he had left, right? He even says, I just crossed here with just a staff, and I'm coming back with two parties. He was a wealthy man. He was a blessed man. He was spiritually blessed. So that's what it's all about. But you, it is impossible to be chastened without the Holy Spirit. Why? The Holy Spirit is our comforter, our counselor, our helper. Without the Holy Spirit, you will not understand the chastening of the Lord. It might look like the devil to you. But that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He comforts you, he helps you, and he counsels you. It's impossible to do that in our own strength. It's impossible to do that in the flesh. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our guide. He gives us the power to live the Christian life. He gives us the love. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. Without the Holy Spirit, you will not understand the love of Jesus. It will not make sense to you. The Holy Spirit will give you passion to follow. The Holy Spirit will give you conviction when you get off the path. He'll give you comfort and He'll give you counsel. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot live a holy life because He is the guide. That's why it says there, let me go back to it, that's why it says there that He gives the Holy Spirit after the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. Why does it say through Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ is the baptizer. It's not me. It's not any one of you. Jesus Christ is the one that baptizes you. That's what He said, right? I'm going to send you the comforter. You're going to be baptized. Jesus Christ is the baptizer. But that's who this Holy Spirit is. So without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be holy. Without the Holy Spirit, we will become, even if you don't like it, you will become profane. Ever wondered why it says Holy Spirit and not Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit works holiness within us. That's what He does. Because all of us need counsel, comfort, encouragement. Because the devil will discourage you. The world will pull you into all kinds of traps. So you need the counsel. And we all need conviction, don't we? All of us. So without the Holy Spirit, we will, if you like it or not, we will become profane. Why? Because we don't live in the Spirit, but in the flesh. And in the flesh, the flesh cannot glory in, in God's presence, right? Right? We cannot glory in God's presence in the flesh, only in the Spirit. So, so the Holy Spirit prepares us that we can actually enter the presence of the Lord. Now, this is not the main point of the message, but it really, I mean, that's where many Christians fail because they don't understand it. Or some Christians think, yeah, I received the Holy Spirit and that's it. No, you need to be filled again and again and again and again and again and surrendered again and again and again and again and say, not me, Lord, but you, Lord. Not my will, but your will. Again and again and again. It doesn't, it's not a one-time decision. It's not a one-time deal. It's a walk. That's the path of holiness. Is day by day by day by day. And yes, you're going to have bad days in there. And you're going to have good days in there. And we have to understand that we need the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will never dishonor our Savior. So without the Holy Spirit, we are in danger of losing our birthright because he keeps on keeps us on that path right it said earlier you can fall from grace the holy spirit will keep you from that all we have to do is say i surrender i welcome you in my life lead me closer to jesus so esau fall from grace because he lived in the flesh and not in the spirit and then it says abundantly not a little bit we like to take a little bit and keep our dignity. We like to take a little bit and continue pleasing men. We like to take a little bit 
and continue on our way, right? Just a little bit. Just a little, you know, a little shot of espresso. That's what we like. But he wants to pour it on us abundantly. Why abundantly? Because it speaks of us losing control and giving him control over our lives. Many Christians, if you look at a motorboat, and you, before you put in the, I think it's called propeller, is that right? Is it that, spin, that thing that spins? Well, many Christians just barely dip that propeller in the water, and they're not going anywhere on the lake. But what we really have to do is you've got to start the motor, and you dunk it in there, fully immersed in the water, and you're going to have great speed. That's why he said abundantly, not a little bit, but abundantly. And it's really, really important. Now, there was another person there, right? I talked about Jacob, and this really blessed me. And I'm going to get deeper into this. I would like to turn with you to Jeremiah 51, and it's verse 17 to 19. And we're now going to look at Jacob. It says there in verse 17, it says, Everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. The images he makes are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless. They are objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. That speaks of what we, you and I, can do in the flesh. It's worthless. The idols in your life, they are worthless. They don't have any breath in them. They are objects of mockery. And when the judgment comes, they will perish. But then it says, the portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the maker of all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. Remember the birthright? The Lord of hosts is his name. So the Lord chose to call himself the portion of Jacob. Portion is capitalized there. That means he calls himself the portion of Jacob. He is not like them. Who is he talking about? About the goldsmith that is ashamed by his own idols. He talks about he is not like the world. He's not like fleshly people. Everything that we do, if we, you and I understand this, everything that you and I do without the Spirit in the flesh has no breath in it. What speaks of breath? The Holy Spirit. When, he's, when it says in the Greek, he breathed life into it, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Everything that you and I can accomplish in our own strength, not for the glory of God, has, n has no value. That's what he says. But the portion of Jacob is not like them. Because he's the maker of all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. And the Christians are his family of his inheritance. And his name is the Lord of hosts. So what does Jacob mean? Why would, he, why would the Lord choose to use Jacob? Jacob means supplanter. That's what the name means. Now, what does the supplanter do? Five things. It's someone or something taking the place of another. By either force, by seizing the opportunity, by scheming and tricking, and by strategizing. Look at Jacob's life. That's exactly what he did, right? He seized the opportunity. He took Esau's place. He tricked his father, strategized with his mother. Man, we talk about names having power. Names have power. You name your kid, that name has power. He was called the supplanter in everything he did. By force, he took the birthright. He seized the opportunity. He tricked his father, his brother, and he strategized with his mother. Why did Jacob do that? We sometimes think that was evil. We sometimes think, oh, that's, I, I can't handle that story. It's so mean. Poor Esau. 
No, Esau had his chance. Esau had the opportunity, like every one of us. Every sinner will have the opportunity to bow his knees to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? I really believe that. And all of us have the opportunity to live a life worthy of the price that he paid. So Jacob saw that. Esau didn't. Jacob saw that. He saw the value of the blessing. He saw the honor. And he saw the birthright that he would receive. And he was willing to cheat and steal in order to get that. That just speaks of his heart. It speaks of he really wanted it. And Esau was just playing games. Are we playing games as Christians? Are you playing games? Do you see the value? Will you do whatever, whatever, whatever it takes? And I'm not saying go sin. That's not what I'm saying. But will you do whatever it takes to follow the Lord, to receive that blessing, that honor, to hear when you enter heaven, welcome, my faithful servant. Is that number one on your compass? Will you repent? Perhaps you're convicted. Maybe you think, maybe I'm a lot like Esau. Will you repent? Well, there's, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He convicts you, right? That's why we need him. Will you defeat Esau by force? Will you defeat the Esau in your life by force? What does it mean by force? We are supposed to overcome the flesh. Thank God, not with our own strength, but with the strength of the Holy Spirit. So will you push Esau out of your life and put Jacob there? Will you do it by force? Exactly what supplanter means. Will you seize the opportunity to revoke the birthright of Esau? To revoke the birthright of a sinner, of a sinful life, of a flesh, fleshly life? That opportunity Jesus has given to you and me. Will you trick the devil out of his own schemes? Because you and, you and I know that there are a lot of schemes in our lives, right? A lot of traps. Will you trick him out of his own schemes? You can only do that with the Holy Spirit. The devil has been around lo a long time. He has fought this type of war for many, many years, decades, centuries. You and I, we have been around for a few years. He is not an amateur. He's not somebody that doesn't know what he's doing. He has a whole arsenal of tricks and all that. But you know what? The Holy Spirit knows them all. He can keep you from that. He can protect you from that. And the truth is, the devil knows it, his place. He knows the authority of the blood. He knows the authority of the sacrifice. The problem is, you and I sometimes don't know that. That is where the problem is. It's not that the devil doesn't know. The demons answered when Jesus said, get out. The devil answered when Jesus said, get out. He lost. He knows where he's going. This is not a mystery to him. He knows exactly where he's going. Some, of, some people don't know where they're going, but the devil knows where he's going. All he wants to do is pull you down with him. That's what he wants. So it's important for you and me to understand the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives. And he has given you and me authority. Why? Because of the birthright. Because we are part of his family. And all of what I am saying will not make sense unless the Holy Spirit will give you a revelation of that. Because it can just come in and it, you'll forget about it. If it's in your fleshly mind, you'll forget about it. But if the Holy Spirit will make that real to you in a moment, you'll have authority. And that's where the demons and all the devil, they, are, they tremble. Because they know it's your rightful authority because you have received the birthright. He knows that. It's us that forget about that. Will you strategize in regards to your life? What do I mean with that? Will you keep the Lord within and the world without? Or will you 
have the world within and the Lord without. That requires strategizing. Plan your life. Not, I'm, I don't mean like according to your will, but make sure that you have enough oil in your lamp. That's what strategizing is about. We want to have oil in our lamp when it becomes dark. The amazing thing is that God is our supplanter. I just was talking about what you and I in our lives, but I want you to look at why did he say the portion of Jacob? Why did he refer Jacob? Why, why, did, he comp why did he use that name? Because he became our supplanter. I want you to think about that for a second. God tricked, right? Remember the five things that supplanter means? It means to trick. It means to strategize, to take the place of another, and by force, and to seize opportunity, right? Those were the five things. To seize opportunity, to take something by force, to strategize, to trick. And all of that is taking someone else's place. Think about that for one second. God tricked the devil into eternal defeat. That's what he did, right? The devil thought he wins by killing Jesus. God tricked him. He tricked him. The devil thought, if I kill Jesus, this is all done. No, no, no. You killed him, or we killed him. He died. What did he do? He won eternal victory for us. He tricked the enemy. Otherwise, the devil would have prevented from Christ being crucified, right? Or tried, but he didn't try to prevent, did he? He didn't. He, he, the hate of the people, well, that was the devil's hand, right? The way he used Judas, that was the devil's, that was the devil's play. But God tricked him. What about the strategy that went into that? The God had strategized to save you and me. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came together. They sat at the table and said, how can we save these sinners? We're going to send Jesus down. He's going to die for them. He's going to conquer death. And we're going to send the Holy Spirit to enable them to live the Christian life. And all through the love of the Father. So they strategized to overcome darkness, to save us, to save you and me. They seized the opportunity they saw an opportunity. This is how we can save John. By doing this. This is how we can save all the people who say yes to the Lord. We're going to do that. Jesus went down by force with authority and conquered death. He conquered darkness. The demons fled when he spoke. That was by force. And then the most precious of, out of them all, Jesus took your and my place. That's what it means to be a supplanter. You take the place of another. You and I should have been on that cross. But Jesus became a supplanter and took yours and mine. He took our place. That's why he says the portion of Jacob. And it goes even further. Remember when Rebecca was telling Jacob, this is what you're going to do. She was, what, strategizing? And she, he said, no, 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 no. What if, what if Isaac is going to find out and instead of blessing me, curse me. Remember that? That's the story. He went to her and she, he said, I'm, uh, I'm a bit nervous about this, okay? And she said, he said, what if he curses me instead of blessing me? We, we are after the blessing, but what if he finds out that it's me and curses me? What did Rebecca say? Let your curse be on me. What did Jesus say for you and me? Let your curse be on me. He took the curse that was rightfully reserved for you and me. So what Rebecca said was exactly what Jesus said. So the story of Jacob is all about Jesus. And it's all about you and me. How are we going to live? Are we going to live like Jacob or are we going to live like Esau? This goes further. I'm not done. 
It blesses me so much. How in the world did Isaac not recognize that it was Jacob? Now think about this. He even said the voice was different. Okay, if, if Hunter and Noah blindfold Josh and come home and Hunter says, I am Noah, I, I call 100% Josh will say, no, 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 you're Hunter, right? A voice, my voice, is very different than Pastor Fred's voice. Larry's voice is different than Pastor Fred's voice. If you would have your eyes closed and Larry comes up here and says, Good morning, I'm Pastor Fred. A lot of you say, no, 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 I, I know you're Larry. Right? So how in the world did he not recognize? He even said your voice was different, but why did it not click? Why did it not click? And he said, why are you back so early, right? Remember? I mean, Esau was a good hunter. We all would like to be as good as him, but he wasn't that good. Even Isaac knew, knew that, right? He said, why are you back so early? And then... The skin of the goat on his hands and on his neck, and Isaac even felt it. How is that possible? How do you get it on there without even feeling it? Did they glue it on? But then it would have ridges, right? You would feel that there's a... No, I mean, if you just think about it in a physical way, or did they tie it on? Well, you would have felt the ropes or the string. So you wonder, how is... The, I always wonder, how is this possible? I'm not entirely sure what Isaac thought. But I can tell you what our Father in Heaven thought. Because Isaac is the representation of our Father. And why do I say that? Hebrews 8, 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. God chose, when He looks at you and me, He sees the sin. From far away, no matter what you're going to do, you cannot hide it. But Jesus came in between, and he doesn't see it. That's what this is talking about. He did not see, he did not feel the skin that it was goat skin. He chose not to realize that it was Jacob's voice. That's exactly what he does with you and me. Think about that. He felt him, he said, huh, this feels odd. God the Father knows when we sin, but he, chose, chooses, he, he's, he looks at Jesus and at the sacrifice that he did over what you and I did. That's what he does every time. All he looks at is our heart. Do they honor my son? Do they live according? Are they giving their best? Are they living a life of holiness? And the sin... It doesn't matter anymore. So as Jacob ignored, as, as Isaac ignored the plain evidence of fraud, God the Father ignores the plain evidence of sin because of what Jesus has done for you and me. That is what the story of Jacob is about. Think about this. Adam and Eve had to put on clothing. What type of clothing? skin of animals to hide their shame and guilt. Jacob had to put on skin, the skin of young goats to hide his shame and guilt. Why? The shedding of blood was necessary to hide the sin and shame of Adam and Eve. That was the first time that blood was shed in the Bible. In order for Jacob to trick Isaac Blood had to flow. Blood had to be sacrificed. An animal, an innocent animal had to be sacrificed. Same with you and me. In order for our shame and guilt to not be seen by the Father, He sent His Son. Are we living a life that is worthy of that? How about Jacob's sons? First son is called Reuben. The second son is called Simeon. The third son is called Levi. And the fourth son is called Judah. All speaks of Jesus. Reuben means behold a son. 
Simeon means to be heard. Behold a son that is to be heard. Levi means joined in harmony. What did Jesus did? He joined us in harmony. What does Judah mean? Thanksgiving and praise. So even in his sons, it speaks about Jesus. Behold, a son has come that is to be heard, that joined us in harmony with our Father in heaven. Thank him. Praise him. He is worthy of it. Those are the first four, th four sons of Jacob. But God loves to do this. He loves to use these stories in the Bible to get our heart. That's what he's after. Every story in the Bible will speak of Jesus in some way or another. And his heart is to show to you and me how much he loves us. And we wonder, how do we live a life worthy of that? How do we live a life of holiness? Well, it's not in our strength. It's because of what he has done. And everything in the Bible speaks of what he has done for us. That he would care. I mean, think about this. Thousands of years that he would care to have this happen with Jacob and Esau and Rebekah and Isaac. And that a little man like me can then preach about it and see Jesus in it, that is not a coincidence. Everything from the beginning to the end speaks of Jesus. Everything. And it really all speaks of the love that he has for you. He gave everything for you and me. And my message is, we should give everything to him. And we should live a life that is worthy of that, that every book in the Bible, that every name, every, every story speaks of God's goodness. And we just have a small book. Our book is just very small. Our life, very small. But for all eternity, God has written up this rescue plan to save you and me. That's what I see in that. And that's when I feel the love of the Lord when I go through that and say, Lord, unreal. Unreal. This is amazing. So my heart today was just, you know, sometimes we forget what Jesus has done. And sometimes we get caught up in, you know, the world or we get caught up in religion. We can read this we can read about holiness and we can say, well, that's not me. This is impossible. And we can feel rejected. We can feel guilty. But all we have to do is just say, Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Let me get a taste of your love. And when that love comes and when we see the love of the Lord through this story, then it's like, oh, it becomes a lot easier to walk this walk suddenly. We're still not going to be perfect. But it becomes a lot easier to follow Jesus, doesn't it? When he becomes that close, it's a lot easier. And that's really the key is we have to be close to the Lord in order to live a holy life. How are we going to be close to the Lord? It's only through the Holy Spirit. He wants to pour him abundantly on you and me. I stayed within my time today. Some of you might be really happy. I just would like to just pray. Um, and I just would give every would like to give everyone the the chance to um, reflect. Uh, just reflect on your life and continue reflecting as you go on into this week, it's going to be a busy week with BBS and all that, but don't, don't ignore that. Don't, you know, if you're stirred in your heart, reflect and let that work in you.
that's really all you can do. Nothing else you can do but let him work in your heart. Let, let him work that conscience. Let him convict. Let him fill you with your love so you are able to live like Jacob. And Jacob's life wasn't all roses and rainbows after he received the blessing. There were trials and fights and low days and dark days. And that's the same for us. But be encouraged that when you come back, when you meet the Lord, you're going to say, Lord, I left with just a staff. The moment when you met me, I had nothing worthy of, of you. There was nothing in my life that was worthy, that was good. I just had a staff. I had nothing else. Maybe you feel like that even today. You feel perhaps, Lord, I have nothing to offer to you. And you would be right. There's really nothing we can offer. Nothing. We have nothing but a staff. But when you realize the birthright, when you realize the value, the honor, when you receive the blessing, when you meet him, you're going to say, Lord, when I said yes to you, I had nothing. And now, as you enter into his glory, you're going to say, I have returned with two parties. I have more wealth that I can count. I have been more blessed than I deserve. I have been more honored than I deserve. And I know you now. Remember, that's what happened in Jacob's life. He knew the Lord. He wrestled with him. And that's what he's after today with you. You might say, I have nothing but a staff. Or you might say, Lord, I have two parties right behind me, right with me. So you might be in a place of recognizing already what God has done and you living already in that wealth of blessing and love and the power of the Holy Spirit. All these things are already a part of you. Or you recognize, Lord, I really... I'm coming out of a valley. I'm in a valley. I have nothing to offer but a staff. But he is faithful. He'll meet you there and he'll take you and he'll bless you. More than you deserve. More than I deserve. So this is an important step for some of you. Some of you are in a valley. And it's okay to say I have nothing but a staff. Some of you have been betrayed by Laban. The same as in Jacob's story. Some of you are facing an angry Esau on the other side of the river. Some of you are in fight in a war with Esau in your life. Their flesh is so strong. The discouragement is so strong. Perhaps even the enemy is so strong. But all you have to say is, Lord, I have nothing but a staff, but I have you. And I say yes to you. And you think I'm in, a, I'm in turmoil, I'm in a, in a tailspin, there's no way out. All you have to do is say, I have nothing but a staff. Who is the staff? Who is the staff? Your staff has guided me, right? Through the valley of death. Moses had nothing but his staff. Moses said, who am I? I can't even talk. Sometimes I feel like that with my German accent. I can't even talk. Who am I? But look what he did with Moses. Look what he did with Jacob. So no matter where you are at, no matter how strong the discouragement is, and I really feel that there are people here today that are discouraged, that are in a valley, that don't even know how to go any further. Fall on the Lord. Uh, he'll take you.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking our place. Thank you, Father, for writing up this story. Centuries that all you wanted was to rescue us from ourselves, to rescue us from sin, to rescue us from darkness. I just ask you, Lord, that your word would penetrate people's hearts and minds today. I ask that they would fall on you, even if they're in the valley of death, even if there's no hope, even if they think they're not worthy. When they look at all the things in their lives that are not right, like Moses did, that then they wouldn't be capable of serving you, that they're not worthy to be called a Christian, that they're not worthy of the Christian walk. I ask you, Lord, that you would touch that heart right now of that person. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to renew that mind of that person. That you make new connections according to their birthright. I ask you, Lord, that people in this church and that are listening would understand what it means to be a Christian and the honor and the blessing and the birthright that, that is there for them, that they just have to receive and walk in. I ask you, Lord, for every person in this room that is nervous of surrendering more to the Holy Spirit, that is too much affected by the flesh and by the world around them. I ask you, Lord, that by your grace that you would show them what it means to be spirit-filled, what it means to follow the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our guide, our helper. I just ask you, Lord, that people would leave today changed. I ask you, Lord, that they would continue to change throughout the week, that they would be blessed by this message that they would change, that they would see themselves like you see them, Lord. And I specifically pray for the people that have lost hope, that they would understand that they are heirs according to the hope which is in you for eternal life. Lord, we just come even against any strongholds, any darkness that is poisoning their thinking, that is playing with their emotions, that plans lies, that plans, that pl that plans restlessness. I just ask you, Lord, to give them grace to come to a stop, to rest for a while and to find you, Lord. all the whips of the darkness that, that they would be stopped. They are just chasing people around. But they would come to a place where they can say, I have had nothing but a staff and I returned with two parties, Lord. We thank you for your love. Thank you for taking our place. Move upon your people, Lord. I really, I ask you to, to change lives. That's, that's all we want, including mine, Lord including mine. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.